space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. This is actually a simple proof of Kepler's second and third laws of planetary motion. Kepler's second law states that the line joining a planet and a sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Here is a graphical representation of this law. As long as these two orbital periods are equal, the areas here and here will be the same. The easiest way to show that this is true is by showing that the derivative of the area swept out by the line with respect to time is constant at all times t. If we can show this, then that will prove Kepler's second law. Let us note the position of the planet with the vector r. The planet's velocity v is the first derivative of the r vector and its acceleration vector is the second derivative of the position and the first derivative of the velocity. Let us also define a new vector h as the cross product between the position vector r and the velocity vector v. shown here. It was shown by Stewart in Calculus Early Transcendentals that h is a constant non-zero vector. It was proven quite simply that h was a constant by taking the derivative with respect to time of r cross v, which yields r prime cross r prime plus r cross r double prime. Both of these cross products are zero because any vector crossed with itself is zero and any vector crossed with a vector parallel to itself is zero. This means that h is some constant vector. We know the vector is also not zero because the planet will always have a velocity component and will always have a position component. Let us compute the value of h by first computing the vector v and crossing it with the vector r. Let us redefine the vector r in rectangular coordinates. By taking the derivative of r with respect to time, we get this expression, which, when crossed, the original vector r yields a very simple expression. This we know to be constant because we know that h is constant, and this r cross r prime, or r cross v, is a non-zero constant vector. Good to know. But what does that have to do with the area being swept out? Well, the area swept out by any polar curve is given by this expression applies for any polar curve, including our convenient definition of the r vector as r theta. Substituting in our values into the exact same expression yields this. Let's make a variable substitution for time, because we are dealing with equal times, not equal angles. We know that an infinitesimal change in angle d theta is equal to the derivative of that angle with respect to time times an infinitesimal change in time, dt. We must also change the upper and lower bounds of the integral to go from 0 to t rather than from 0 to theta. Taking the derivative of both sides with respect to time yields due to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Remember all the work we did before computing the value of h? 
Well, that all comes back right now. We've actually just proved Kepler's second law. Because the rate at which the area swept out is constant, any equal time will sweep out an equal area. Let us now prove Kepler's third law. The third law states that the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis, shown here. In order to prove this, we must find an expression for the square of the orbital period that is equal to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis times some constant. Remember from our derivation of the second law that the area swept out at time t is equal to one half the integral from zero to t of r squared d theta by dt times dt. Let's substitute in t equals t for the orbital period of the planet. Remember that the magnitude of r squared times d theta by dt is the same as the magnitude of the constant vector h meaning that we can simply rewrite this as the integral from 0 to t dt. Evaluating the integral yields the magnitude of h t over 2. The area of an ellipse is given by a equals pi a b. b's, where b is the length of the semi-minor axis and a is the length of the semi-major axis. I A B equals the magnitude of H times T over 2. Rearranging to get an expression for T, we get T equals pi A B times 2 divided by the magnitude of H. Let's go out on a limb and define the eccentricity of an elliptical orbit as the magnitude of C divided by G M and D as the magnitude of H squared divided by the magnitude of C. Multiplying the two together, we can see that E D is equal to the magnitude of H squared divided by G M. Here are two more equations that Stuart conveniently defined for us in this textbook. We now know that b squared over a is equal to ed after making the appropriate substitutions and canceling everything out. Squaring our original equation up at the top yields. Rearranging this equation here for b squared gives us and finally, rearranging this equation over here, substituting everything into the equation, proving Kepler's third law. I hope that you enjoyed this video and have a very Merry Christmas.